Well, you know, the, um, all the Oscar buzz this week is about uh, the King's Speech, where George VI uh, overcomes his stammering. And it occurred to me as the, one of the readers, and given the privilege of being one of the readers, that one of our blessings is we get to hear the King's Speech without stuttering every week, I think. And so it's a great blessing. <clears throat> One of the things I appreciate about the Bible is its descriptions of faith and life are keenly accurate. Today's scripture passage from Galatians is a great example of just how inspired the Bible is. Our focus today is to understand our own inner struggle of good and evil, our sinful nature, and our regenerated spiritual nature. We all want to win the war with ourselves. Let's begin by looking at Galatians chapter 5. Please open up your Bibles, pull out your message outlines, and follow along. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not, obligation to the law, not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Now, I wonder how, I wonder how Paul knew about Washington, D.C. <clears throat> let, me, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Well, Galatians 5.17, huh? What does it really mean? I, I know what's right, but I do what's wrong? I guess that makes sense. I mean, I do know what's right, but it is so easy to do the wrong thing. I mean, I've got some habits so deeply ingrained in me that, well, when sin shows up, it's just a reflex at times to do what I have always done. Man, I'm so glad to have the night off. Finally, an evening to relax and do what I want to do. Hey, can you come over and help me set up for youth group? Yeah, I'd love to. Liar. But uh, I need to bake, bake a cake for someone who's on fire. Oh. Well, all right. Maybe next time. Okay, sure. So, I obviously have a problem with lying. But it's just a little stuff. Yeah, but God frowns on that sort of thing. No one gets hurt. But it, it's still wrong. Then there are times I struggle to do the right thing. I mean, for example, it's 9 o'clock and all of Squim is asleep. <laughs> I'm at the corner of, of Washington and Squim Dungeon Nest. The light is red. And there's no one around. Now, do I have to wait for that light to turn before I go when nobody, nobody is coming? Ah! 
Should I go? Stay. Go? Stay. But there's no one there. Yeah, but it's the law. <sighs> go. Stay. And then there are times when the habits are so deeply ingrained inside me that it's, why, it's a literal battle inside me just to figure out how to do the right thing. Money spent on... Time spent with... Where should I give my resources? I resolve to. Do I give my money to the church? Well, I talked with my grandma last week. I could help someone out. Eat right, read my Bible, and exercise more often. I mean, why use all my cash when I have so many credit cards? Computer games are much more interesting. But I want to keep my stuff. Yeah, but then there's chocolate and TV, and the couch is much more comfortable. Do you see? Do you see? Wouldn't it just be simpler? Wouldn't it just be easier to do what I've always done? So what are we to do about that? How do we change? I know it exists. But now what? We all experience an inner war, don't we? we? We all suffer from this tug of war, this conflict. The key is, well, it is an issue of self-control. Now, don't tell me the Bible's not relevant. Listen to what... Paul says in Romans chapter 7, he says, I, I don't really understand myself for what I want to do, what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate, and that's the proof that sin is living in me. The inner battle that we have, it's proof that sin lives in us, that there is a, a battle of good and evil, so to speak, inside of us. It is so common that, well, the great Winston Churchill said, I, I feel like I'm a walking civil war. And many times, I don't know about you, but you know, it's easy to feel like I'm a walking Civil war. The Bible encourages us in terms of this battle. It also warns us, as it does in Proverbs 25, 28. Like a city that is broken into and without walls is the one who has no control over their spirit. How do we get control of our spirit? Well, to do that, we need to understand the conflict, the battle. We have to understand who the enemy is. And the Bible is clear the reason we have this internal civil war, this internal conflict, is because there is a conflict between our sinful nature in the Spirit of God. That is part of the human condition. Now how do we know that we're, we're in this civil war and how do we know that our spiritual nature is not winning out but our sinful nature is? Paul wants to make it clear to us when we're losing the battle when our sinful nature is winning out. So he gives us a list. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants us to do. 
these two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. We all have good intentions that don't play out in our life. Why is that? The reason is is that there's this influence inside of us that's not good. It's bad, it's sinful, it's evil, and it's doing battle with the Spirit of God within us. Now how do we know that this is true? Because we're all casualties, aren't we? We're all casualties. We've all experienced our sinful nature winning out over our spiritual nature. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Now I want to say something about this list. If you pick up Cosmo and you read it, This isn't the list you're going to find. You pick up uh, most self-help books. This is not the list you're going to find. And it's interesting, God's the one that gets to make the list. We don't get to make the list. Because God knows what our sinful nature really is better than we do. And trust me, we do not as a society understand sinful nature any longer. Our morality has has been watered down to I can do whatever I want to do with whoever wants to do it with me. I can do whatever feels good to me in the moment with whoever wants to do it with me. That's not the list I'm going to read. Now, what does God say our sinful nature looks like? And Paul understands humanity very well, so he starts with sexual immorality. Not sexual freedom. We're living in a society of sexual freedom, aren't we? We are. And, you know, I know in this service when I start talking about sleeping with whoever we want to sleep with, that you might say, look, we're a bunch of old people, what are you talking about? We don't sleep anymore. (laughs) It applies to your age group as well, doesn't it? Because you know people. Sexual immorality, what's a simple way to define it? Paul says, as you understand it, it's sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman. It's very clear. You don't have to be a, a Bible scholar to figure out what sexual immorality is. But isn't it interesting because we want to do whatever feels good to us with whoever we want to do it with. We want to ignore sexual immorality. But I can tell you, it's not good for anyone. Sexual immorality is a sin of the body. That's why Paul starts with it first. And Paul makes it clear that the sins of the body are worse for us. And I'll I'll simply say this. Find me, find me the psychological, sociological, theological benefit of sexual immorality. Because I've not read it. I've not read anything consistent, anything scholarly that says sexual immorality is good for those involved, or for society as a whole. I can tell you, 
sexual intimacy in marriage is good for the couple and it's good for society. I could show you all sorts of, of good data psychologically, sociologically, theologically that says sexual intimacy, exclusive sexual intimacy in marriage between a man and a woman is very good. Very good. In fact, exclusivity with a sex partner is the number one determiner of the longevity of that relationship. Isn't that interesting? Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. Man, it's still relevant, isn't it? Okay, you can breathe now. I'm not going to talk about sex anymore. <sighs> I'm glad. Okay. Then he goes on to impurity. Talked about impurity of the body. Now he uses the word impurity because he's really talking about purity of the mind and the heart. Then lustful pleasures. Guys, get this. We understand lustful pleasures. Then idolatry. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Idolatry is worshiping, like God, anything that is man-made. And it's interesting how we, we worship lots of things around us, don't we? I, I, I do love my car. But it's interesting how we have a tendency to worship well, our houses, our toys, the money we made, we worship it. It's our source of security, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Witchcraft, we're not really into that, so although you're influenced on a daily basis by it more than you might realize. Hostility. Oh. Quarreling. Yo. Anyone here never quarrel? I'm just checking. Okay. I'm just checking. Well, you know, I, I, I know how... You notice this list that Paul starts with. Sex, when we got to sexual immorality, we there were a bunch of us that went, well, we're, you know... We're not, we're not messing around with anybody we're not supposed to be messing with. So we're, we're safe. No, then he gets down to quarreling. Jealousy, you ever been jealous? Yo. How about outbursts of anger? And I love the idea, outbursts of anger. You know why? Because in, the out, in anger, it comes out comes out and we we it comes out in in uh, in hurtful words sometimes it comes out in in uh, uh, you know in, in physical ways uh, with fists and things flying through the air oh well we're safe we we've never done any of those things but you've gone to your room and pouted haven't you ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, darn. I was just feeling good about my outbursts of anger. Hmm. Selfish ambition. You ever had a selfish ambition? I, I know what people think when I'm going through this list. People say, yeah, but pastor, you, you know, the cards are stacked on these things in your direction. Right? But I, I can tell you what. I had to admit at one part of my life, I, I was being very, I had very selfish ambitions. In fact, I had the, the most addictive kind of selfish ambition that you can have. It's called success. When I started out in ministry, literally every door I approached opened. And one day, I had to realize that wasn't a God thing as much as it was a Scott thing. My wife was good in helping me see this, of course. Yeah, that Holy Spirit, it always speaks through my wife. I don't know why. 
you know, Holy Spirit is, you, is described with a feminine noun once in the Bible. Um, how about dissensions? Have you been in a group and have you gone off in the corner and had a conversation with someone else about everybody else? Ooh. Or about them? Ooh. Wow. Yeah, that's dissension. That creates divisions, doesn't it? Envy, you ever been envious of anything, anyone? Sure you have. Now, by now, Paul's created a circle that includes everybody in the room, including me. Drunkenness, I did that a few times before I was a Christian. I, I did. I mean, I, I, didn't get out of, I didn't get out of elementary school. I, I, I done, I done, by the sixth grade, we did just about everything on this list. It's true. I, I, I hung with a fast crowd in the sixth grade. Drunkenness, orgies. Now, here's the deal. We want to just check off this list, list, get to the bottom of it, and go, okay, I know now. Ooh. And then Paul throws in this little phrase, and other sins like these. So, Notice that Paul is being selective here, not exhaustive here. There are other signs that your sinful nature is winning out, but let me tell you, Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. Not a bad list for today, is it? I, I can tell you, it's not a bad list for me. And the fact that we've got to check one or more of the items on that list, that's proof that we're a casualty and that our sinful nature has won out in our life. So how do we win over this enemy? It's very simple. It's an issue of self-control. Self-control will enable the Spirit to win in your life. I don't know if you've ever been in a big tug-of-war. Um, I've actually been in some of those really huge team tug-of-wars. Have you ever noticed one thing about those team tug-of-wars? All the really big guys get to be at the back. And they always put the little guys like me up in the front. And, and when you lose, do you know who gets pulled through the mud? Though It's always the little guy. We're hanging on. Back in the back, the big guys go, we're toast. And they what? They let go of the rope, don't they? Now, isn't it interesting? There's a tug of war going on inside of you. The way to let the Spirit win is to let go of the rope. To let go of your sinful nature. And the way you let go of your sinful nature is self-control. Now it's interesting how Paul lines things out. He's talked about the battle of the sinful nature and the spirit, and then he's given us a list just so we don't misunderstand. And then, just so we don't misunderstand, he's also given us a list of how we know the spirit is winning out in our life. What I find really interesting, everybody wants to mess with the sinful list. Nobody wants to, to mess with the spiritual list. Nobody questions any of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? But the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit, notice, it's not plural. 
That means when the Holy Spirit resides in you, you get all of these. Yeah, you have some, pr- some puny fruit, that's true. But you got all of them. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I, I don't know if you're a farmer, and, and I lived in farm country, and I had my little farm, you know, my little uh, garden and my fruit trees in my backyard, and you know what determines the kind of fruit on the tree in terms of the quality of the fruit? It has everything to do with where the tree is planted. And if you want to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you got to get planted in God. You got to get planted in God's Word. And I could go on. There's a 20 passages that talk about the Word of God being the place that you need to plant your life. And if you're honest, maybe you're not planted there. And you play around with it a little bit, right? Everybody has a Dalmatian view of the Bible. It's spotty. There's spots we like and spots we don't like. Okay? You ever transplant a tree? It always affects the production of the tree. Always. Okay, self-control leads to freedom. That's the exact opposite of what society is telling you. What society says to you, if you really want to have freedom, then you ought to be able to do whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it, with whoever you want to do it with. And it's interesting that there is no freedom in that kind of living. And the proof of that is, is addictions. The proof of that is our fixations. Now, fixations usually come before addiction. And isn't it interesting, with all the freedom there is, addictions are not going down. They're doing what? They're going up. Why is that? Because living by our sinful nature, well, our sinful nature becomes our dictator. And if you've ever talked to anybody with a fixation or an addiction, they'll tell you they are a slave to their sin. That instead of dictating to their life, their fixation or their addiction is dictating to them how they're going to live their life. And gee, wouldn't you think with the human potential movement, we'd be doing better? But we're not. It's really, well, see, now you know why I was late the last time, getting, why I was late getting in here. It's interesting to notice the downturn in so many indicators of what we would consider a quality of life. Not not only worldwide, but in America. And if I had more time, I, I could delineate a list of them. I'll just give you a, a simple one you can all relate to. There are more hungry people in America today than there were 10 years ago. That's human potential at work? No. That's sinful nature at work. If we're not careful, our sinful nature becomes our dictator. I, I, I love what Chuck Swindoll says. He says, why do we need self-control? Because self-control gives us an ability to have victory over the things that we despise about ourselves. Oh, That's an interesting question. Is there something about you that you despise? Hmm. 
Now, I'll ask it to you this way because it's easier to get a handle on it. What is it that you dislike about yourself? Now, everybody's got something that they dislike about themselves. What you dislike about yourself is usually a byproduct of your sinful nature. And the only reason why you don't despise it is because you're looking at it from your perspective instead of God's perspective. Because when I look at my life from God's perspective, there's a few things I despise about how I live and what I think and what my attitude is from time to time. Yeah, there's some things I dislike about myself. We need the Spirit to win. Don't you realize, Paul says, that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All the athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will, what, fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize, and everybody's running a race. I'll just ask you the simple question, what prize is it that you're after? Is it truly an eternal prize? Nah, I, I meddled last week. I'm really meddling today. Some of you will never come back. Last week I talked about the fact that we're a comfortable community. And you might mull over this week whether comfort is always a sign that you're running the race for eternity. Well, what's your prize that you're after? Financial security? Comfort? Ease? Your house? Your toys? I can tell you what, when you get to eternity, you're not taking it with you. All that effort all that time, all that talent, you're not taking it with you. You get to take two things when you go to eternity. And I've mentioned this to you. One is your character. And the second thing is everybody that you've influenced eternally. And that's it. You're not taking your portfolio. You're not taking uh, your prominence. You're not taking... uh, anything. That's it. That's all you take. Isn't it? Wow. And I'm running so hard. For what? For what? Paul says you need to realize you're all running a race. And you got to decide whether you want earthly trophies or whether you want an eternal reward. And it has everything to do with your discipline training. Now, I understand that I started in competition when I was five years old. And I was in competition at least twice a month, if not every week, until I graduated from college. And I was training for something virtually every day. In college, 5 o'clock every morning. Got picked up outside my dorm, rain or shine, snow, sleet, minus 30 below. They didn't care. An hour and a half in the morning, go to class. An hour and a half in the afternoon. For virtually every day of the year. I understand training. If you think training's easy, then go hang out at Sark. Because it's not easy. It takes intentionality. It takes control of your time and your aspirations in your life. Got to take the enemy head on. I discipline my body like an athlete. 
training it to do what it should. You know what's interesting is your body never really wants to do what it's supposed to do when you're doing an athletic endeavor. That's why you have to practice. It's called muscle memory. There are very few people, for instance, that can pick up a bat and swing a bat the right way or a tennis racket or if you really want to know about evil, take up golf. Right? Your body naturally does not want to do what you're supposed to do when you hit a golf ball. It's really interesting. So you have to do what? Practice. And I can tell you this, you're all practicing towards something because you're all running a race. We all are. Is it an earthly prize that you're disciplined towards or is it an eternal prize? I can't choose that for you. You've got to choose that. How do you you take on the enemy nose to nose? One, don't overestimate your ability. When it comes to this conflict inside of us, we often overestimate our ability. I got a lot of reasons to overestimate my ability when it comes to an inner war. Hmm. Don't don't overestimate your willpower. Because willpower is not powerful enough most of the time in life. The other thing is is don't underestimate the consequences, and we all want to do that. We all want to do that. We all want to underestimate the consequences. I wish it was different, but it's not. You're going to die, and when you die, you're going to stand before Jesus, and Jesus is going to ask you two simple questions. Number one, what did you do about me? What decision did you make about me being the Lord of your life? And then the second question he's going to ask you is, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with it? What race did you run? We're all going to have to answer those questions. Because we'll all stand in judgment before God. So don't Ignore or don't underestimate the consequences of your sinful behavior, your sinful attitude, your sinful thinking. And if you're like me, I love to be lulled into a sense of security. I love it. Don't get lulled into a sense of security. So what we need to do is discipline our our bodies, our minds, and our soul. First of all, you got to discipline your body. Don't let your body go where it shouldn't go. Okay? Don't, if you're on a diet, go to the donut shop. I don't care what they say on the sign. There are no healthy donuts. A healthy donut is called a bagel. Don't let your body go where it shouldn't go. Don't go to the donut shop. Don't go to the porn shop. Don't go to the sale at Macy's, if that's your thing. I know, I know. But for some people, well, it may not be an addiction, but it's a fixation. They feel bad, and so instead of eating donuts because they want to be thin, they need retail therapy. Right? Don't let your mind go where it's not supposed to go. And that's tough to do in this day and age. Just got a smartphone. I got access to everything right at the palm of my hand. I got so I got so much work done sitting, waiting for something the other day. It was amazing. I was texting people, two people at a time. I was going on the internet. I was finding directions. 
And there's a lot of good to that, but it also makes things very accessible. You can buy online around the world 24 hours a day now, can't you? And whatever your fixation or addiction is, you can have it delivered in a day from the other side of the planet. You need to build some spiritual habits. Here's 201. Yes, part of living the Christian life is not doing what you shouldn't do. And isn't it interesting, when you're doing what you are supposed to do, you don't have to worry so much about what you're not supposed to do. Because you're too busy doing what you're supposed to do. Right? Yay! You're here! Yay! Worship, Bible study, prayer, service, fellowship. Those are spiritual habits that we need to develop and go into training. And most of us read our Bibles and pray to God like we do when it comes to walking up a steep hill. Infrequently and only when we need something. What race are you running today? And I'm not saying that earthly races and eternal races are mutually exclusive to one another. But if you don't have eternity as the goal of your race, you can't be sure that the other legs of the race that you're running are in the right direction. And I know how people are about all of this. They'll just do nothing. If I do nothing, you know, it's interesting. I'm not going in a bad direction. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, but that doesn't mean you're going in a good direction. God has a plan and a purpose for our life. And I can tell you, it's way above whatever plan or purpose you ever thought you had in life. In fact, I heard a speaker say last week to a bunch of pastors, he says, look, he says, God's placed you there for a reason, and that's an important position. He says, do not step down and become the president of the United States. You know why? That's just about today. That's not about eternity. So what race are you running today? Who's winning the inner war between the Spirit of God and the sinfulness that lies within each and every one of us? We have to choose. We have to choose. Let us pray. Lord, I know that, uh, that passages like Galatians are just not all that easy to read and digest. In fact, the, the whole issue of our sinful nature, our, our general pattern is this, we just want to turn our back on it. Yet that doesn't really give us the victory that you want us to have and that we need. Lord, help us to allow your spirit to win in the inner war within us. And Lord, we know that happens by having the right goal in mind in life, making your priorities our priorities, going into good training. And Lord, as you speak to us in this moment, Help us, Lord, to get out of neutral. Help us to stop going in a self-righteous direction. But, Lord, help us to go in your direction, at your pace, with your purpose and your plan and your power. Amen.